Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining in. I'm Dr. Kim Newell Green, and I'll be the moderator for today's virtual grand round on the subject of long COVID, otherwise known as post acute sequelae of SARS CoV 2. Next slide, please. You can see here our disclosures. Next slide, please. Um, and this is our agenda today. Next slide, please. And just a reminder that we that CME is provided for this series. Um, so just make sure that when you're sent a survey after the completion of the webinar, you attest your attendance and then you will get your certificate. Next slide, please. So as we continue to wrestle with the ongoing day to day of the pandemic, though things are certainly looking brighter now, a large outstanding question is what are the long term effects of contracting COVID-19? And we're seeing things in the news about this even as I speak. So we're delighted today to have a couple of experts to help guide us in this. We're going to talk with Dr. Ann Foster, who is a leader in the UC health system, who's thinking about how as a nation, a state and a health system, we can take the best care of the potentially large numbers of people who are suffering from prolonged symptoms after having had a COVID infection. We'll also hear from Dr. Lucy Horton, who's a clinical expert on the post-acute sequela of SARS-CoV-2. But first, we'll welcome back Dr. Eric Capon, the California State Epidemiologist, to give us updates on the state of COVID-19 in California. Please do remember to submit any questions you may have in the presentations by using the question box in the control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. As always, I'll try to go over as many as I can as time allows. Let's begin with Dr. Pon. Thanks, Erica. Great, thank you so much for having me again today. Um, and we can launch into slides. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next one. So today uh, I want to uh, just you know, do some of the updates I often do on kind of where we are as our epidemiology and vaccines, um, talk a little bit about our California Smarter Plan in the next phase, um, and then touch on some of our long COVID collaborations um, since that is the topic of the day. Uh, so let's go ahead and next slide. So this is kind of the epidemic curve I show you guys pretty much every time I'm here. And just to highlight again, the huge peak that we saw with Omicron surge as far as the blue level of cases. So we peaked um, over 153,000 cases were reported um, as far as that was when they were tested or their onset date on January 4th. And then thankfully a steady decline since then. And then uh, what you see in the orange line is our hospitalizations, which I'll show you a deeper dive in a moment. The red is deaths. Um, which, and I'll have another slide to kind of illustrate this as well too, but you can see actually, even though Omicron is less serious because we had so many cases, we had more deaths from Omicron than we did during the Delta surge and probably more than during the, last, the summer surge of 2020 as well. Um, and then the black one is ICU, which has been thankfully also relatively stable during the Omicron surge. Next slide. Uh, and so this uh, version I've also shown you on prior, uh, grand rounds as well. This is how we've been looking at our overall, the lower right-hand box of California total hospital census, and then the percent of uh, people in the hospital that are COVID positive, and then by region. So some of the dashed lines that you see there as far as hallmarks have been either um, in the top part, 10 or 20% above uh, kind of a baseline census has been concerning. That would be all patients. And so as you can see during this last Omicron surge, um, many uh, regions got uh, above or close to 20% above their usual capacity. And then the lower um, solid colored line is the percent positive again in the hospital. So right now we are again, as you can see in all regions decreasing, thankfully, and only San Joaquin Valley uh, has over 20% of their um, hospital census now. And um, gradually improving. Um, and then uh, now we actually have most regions, actually all regions have less than 10%. Uh, that lower line is actually, I believe, 10% um, of COVID positive patients, which uh, is also the, the parameter as far as new admissions, percent new admissions that the CDC is looking at as well as far as hospitalization indicators. So all of those are absolutely encouraging signs that things are definitely improving. Next slide. And then wanted to highlight, um, many of you have seen both in this setting and others, we've highlighted uh, a couple things. One, that uh, cumulative deaths actually from 
between California compared to other large states have been the lowest um, across different states per capita. And we've also had among the lowest pediatric hospitalizations compared to other large states. So you can see this blue line on the bottom is our pediatric hospitalizations. Um, uh, rates and I think we're really proud of all the work that California has done together to protect ourselves and minimize um, morbidity and mortality from this serious disease. Next slide. Um, how are we doing as far as vaccine progress? So this kind of shows you by age and where we still have the biggest concern as you can see here is that only about 31% of our five to 11 year olds are fully vaccinated. Um, there's a sliver in there that are kind of in progress and then you can see we still have 62% of our five to 11 year olds that are not yet uh, vaccinated. So that is something we're really continuing to focus on, really working with uh, parents and families and, um, and community-based organizations to improve those vaccine rates. And um, unfortunately, there's also a lot of disparities there too. I think between our Healthy Places Index quartile, the lowest versus the highest, there's a, a big difference there. Um, and then as far as boosters, just to highlight that for a moment as well, we do have over 57% of people 12 and over have been boosted um, and 73% of the 65 and older. So um, we need to make more progress on the 12 and overs, but um, you know, continuing to, to have improvements there. And vaccination rates have definitely, our daily numbers have been decreasing steadily um, as the Omicron surge has declined. Next slide. Um, this, in order to help encourage and show the importance of vaccines, wanted to show this. I think I've shown you all this before too, but this is the latest updated version to show. Uh, the orange line is people have gotten the primary series, um, so those two doses. Uh, and then the green is how much difference the boosters are actually making for vaccine effectiveness. This is our crude vaccine effectiveness in California, comparing our immunization registry with all of our cases. Um, so again, you can see the the, the huge difference in boosting um, versus fully vaccinated, especially when there's a lot of disease being transmitted. So there's a bigger gap during a surge, as you can see here. Um, and again, to highlight even um, uh, that for hospitalizations, once you're boosted, it's over 90% effectiveness, and for deaths, it's actually over 95%. And even for cases, you know, things are getting closer together again as we have lower uh, rates of transmission, but we are close to 90% uh, there as well for vaccine effectiveness um, here in California. Next slide. And so uh, what is next? You know, how are we thinking about now that we're coming out of this Omicron surge, uh, how we continue to learn to live with this virus. Next slide. Um, I wanted to just, for a moment, there's a couple slides here about, uh, a lot of people talked about, are we at an endemic phase yet? And what does that mean? And for most of us, what endemic means is it's more like other diseases we deal with all the time that don't impact our um, hospitals significantly that don't disrupt our daily lives necessarily. So, so some people are saying, ah, it's just like the flu. But I would say, if you look at this data, this is flu and COVID pediatric deaths, um, 17, 18, sorry, the formatting is a little skewed on this slide, but the second blue bar here is the 17, 18 flu season. And actually even 19, 20 um, for pediatrics, 17, 18 overall was one of our worst, most serious flu seasons. Um, in recent years. And in 1920, we had actually even more pediatric deaths, unfortunately. But you can see in 2020, 21, during that last winter surge, we had almost double, actually more than double, let's see, well, almost double the number of pediatric deaths. So this is causing more um, pediatric deaths, certainly than flu. And that is uh, in a pre-vaccine era, we are still, of course, gonna be monitoring closely as far as um, COVID this year and with the Omicron surge, um, but just to show you again that this is not um, not at a level yet that is similar to the flu, including in, in kids. Next slide. This one is a little busy. Oh, let's see, can we go back to this? Uh, the other, thank you. Um, so this one, um, I just wanna illustrate this point again too, that um, what this shows you is, uh, percentage of deaths. Um, so there's total all-cause deaths is the gray bar. And then drawing your eye to the flu, which is the orange line and red, which is coronavirus. And looking back from 1718 to now, again, 1718 was one of our more serious flu seasons with H3N2 several years ago. And you can see that um, as far as percentage of all-cause deaths, flu caused still less than 5% of all-cause deaths um, in that very serious season. And then you can see what COVID has been doing over the last several surges and still way, way, way above the impact of flu. Um, 
from a serious season. So this means we are not um, at a stage where this is, you know, endemic or normalized yet, but we hope we are going to be getting there. But I just wanted to show some of that data again, uh, especially to all of you as clinicians to say, we are not at a place yet where this is just like the flu. Next slide. Um, so how is California thinking about this next phase? Um, we want to stay ready. We want to continue to use the tools that we have that we've learned so much about. So vaccines, masks, well fit and um, good filtration, um, and maintaining our awareness. So we are absolutely being vigilant. We continue to do um, surveillance, whole genome sequencing, monitoring for that next variant. Um, and other readiness as far as being uh, prepared to deal with surges. Um, so we know there's gonna be a next variant. We just don't know if it's gonna be less serious or more serious, um, and we need to be prepared. So we're maintaining readiness as a state, um, continue to increase testing um, capacity across the state. Also, of course, this shift to have more and more availability of antigen testing and more over-the-counter testing um, really helps for timely uh, diagnosis and, and um, action, um, which was highlighted last month. And then schools, we absolutely want to continue to prioritize using all of our tools um, as we can to make sure that we keep kids safely in schools for in-person instruction. And what's very exciting is that we are seeing more and more treatments evolve and um, more treatments increasingly becoming available to help treat this, uh, this virus. Next slide. Um, so on that note, we've had some changes as far as as things get better, we're slowly kind of, you know, wanting to be able to titrate these tools as we need them. So using, maximizing these tools when disease levels are high and being able to back off of them when disease levels are improving. Um, so as you all know, as of March 1st, uh, we moved from a masking requirement in indoor public settings to a strongly recommended. And then um, uh, starting basically, it will be through the end of this week. So starting next Monday, schools um, will have at least from the state level, a strongly recommended masking guidance, but not a requirement from the state level. And of course, local authorities are um, are making decisions at that local level and can certainly maintain those requirements for longer, um, depending on their local situations. And we just released actually yesterday um, and posted on our website some guidelines that um, communities can use, whether it's local education authorities or local health departments or individual schools, some guidelines to think about all of these things, vaccination rates, community levels of transmission locally, um, how's your indoor ventilation, all of those things to help you decide where you might want to decide locally on um, whether to continue masking or not in the school. Next slide. And then shifting into the Rx or treatment, um, and again, we've had a, a, a session on this, I think two months ago um, with this group as far as Grand Rounds, but sort of where we are on treatment. So we have um, a prophylaxis um, that some have been approved for and then treatment. Um, so as far as the monoclonal antibodies, unfortunately with Omicron variant and then maybe increasingly with BA2, we've lost a couple monoclonal antibodies. We've gained one, Beptelovimab. Um, and citrovimab, and then we have um, antivirals. So um, uh, remdesivir is IV, of course, um, but now approved for outpatient use, and then Paxlovid and uh, Legevrio. Uh, we, um, and actually next slide will show you a little bit about the, the how much we're getting in California. So starting in January, we started to get more molnupiravir, but as we discussed at a, a prior grand rounds, um, that, particular antiviral has less um, effectiveness than Paxlovid. Um, we have had a little bit more resource for that, but also has potentially more side effects. So it hasn't been, um, it's been more available, but I think less utilized. Uh, I think that's the other theme and reason I included this, both of these slides. I really want to get out messages to clinicians that actually we are starting to hear and see that medications are being, uh, you know, sort of turned away at the local level. So we are working to figure out how to make sure we are getting medications to where they're needed and um, need to kind of increase awareness that if you have patients that are testing positive that are at risk for hospitalization, they really should seek treatment. Um, and again, we have lots of resources in the supplemental sides um, for clinicians as far as finding out where they can get uh, medications in their local area. Next slide. So shifting gears to talk about long COVID, since that is the theme of the day, just as far as um, the California Department of Public Health, what are the kinds of things we're doing? We've been collaborating with UCSF and UCLA on Inspire, 
um, which is a national prospective cohort study looking at incidents, clinical characteristics, and risk factors for post-COVID conditions. And in a moment, I'll tell you a little bit about our role with that. Um, we are also adding a post-acute COVID survey in our local health department tools for cases, um, and that will be addressing symptoms, functional impairment, and healthcare utilization. Um, so that is uh, accessible to local health departments, and it's not widely in use yet, but I think moving forward will continue to be. Um, and then we've done a lot as far as communications, which I'll highlight in a couple slides, um, and working a lot with other CDPH groups, um, uh, again with UC, to really be looking at equitable access to post-COVID information and care. We've been participating with Dr. Foster in her long COVID working group, and really importantly, I think, and mentioned in the SMARTER plan, we are uh, working actively on thinking about how are we going to start assessing the long-term impacts of COVID? So not even just the clinical focus today on long COVID, but what are the other kind of long-term impacts we want to study and assess and use all the lessons learned from this pandemic and make sure it will help continue to inform us moving forward as we respond to this virus in the future. Um, so more to come on that. Next slide. Um, and just a, a few little bit more information on the Inspire collaboration. Um, I mentioned sort of the overarching uh, sort of Inspire and then it's adults um, with symptoms. Um, and so we have cases and controls and it's PCR confirmation for the cases. Uh, there's planned enrollment for over 3,600 cases. Um, and then data is collected via electronic survey for 18 months and review of medical records. Next slide. And our role um, within California, so you can see the other sites that are also Inspire sites, but UCSF and UCLA, um, are, we're working with them to help provide them lists of um, all cases in California so they can have random selection so that it's not just in those catchment areas of those two academic centers um, to really broaden the individuals that would be enrolled. So we're collaborating again to help provide um, a sampling of our overall case registry um, to enroll patients in this, this study. Next slide. And then um, a great uh, sort of partnership and resource with Resolve to Save Lives and doing kind of the voices of long COVID. So we um, just launched a long COVID website on our CDPH site and the link is here. Um, and also um, allowing and, and highlighting some some individual stories from people and just anecdotes and experiences of people, including young, healthy people like the ones highlighted here on how um, how COVID is impacting them in the long term, just to really, again, help encourage people to do everything they can to protect themselves, uh, most importantly, vaccination. And we are seeing more data, which may come up later on, that uh, vaccine is indeed looking like it reduces risk of long COVID, but really trying to get information out there that, um, you know, again, this is not just the flu. We don't see these kinds of outcomes from flu necessarily and really want their community to learn how to protect themselves from, uh, from long COVID. Next slide. So I think I will pause there and turn it over to our other outstanding speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erica, as always. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Foster. Dr. Foster is the Chief Clinical Officer of the University of California Health System. She's responsible for developing, implementing, and monitoring and updating system-wide clinical initiatives to ensure continued alignment of programs with the strategic goals, values, and plans of the system and its health campuses. Big job. Um, she uses a lot of complex data sets and population health strategies to improve care statewide. Dr. Foster's portfolio includes system, system system-wide initiatives, such as consortia leading to address health needs in the areas of cancer, mental health, and virtual care. Um, she reports to the executive vice president of UCH. Prior to her role there, she was the chief medical officer and the chief medical director of the Presbyterian Santa Fe Medical Center in New Mexico. And previously she had served as the chief medical officer for New Mexico's Medicaid program, implementing clinical aspects of the Affordable Care Act and working as part of the team redesigning and expanding the state's Medicaid program, which has grown since to serve 915,000 clients. Dr. Foster earned a degree of medicine from the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, and her role in California brings her back to the University of California, where she obtained her bachelor's degree and her master's of public health degree from UC Berkeley. Additionally, she held academic appointments in OBGYN and reproductive services at UCSF. She will be followed by Dr. Lucy Horton and Dr. Foster will introduce her. Thank you very much to both of you. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Um, thank you all for joining today and a special thanks to CMA, CDPH, and also our UC San Diego uh, expert, Dr. Horton, who I will uh, introduce in just a few minutes. Um, we're really pleased to be with you today to share a little bit more ab about uh, post acute COVID syndrome or long COVID as we generally call it with all of you in our provider community. Um, my remarks are gonna be brief because I really wanna save time for Dr. Horton to provide the clinical overview, but suffice it to say that over the past two years, we have all lived through some incredible historical times and continue to do so. The pandemic, pandemic has challenged our healthcare systems to their cores and further unearthed persisting health disparities and social inequities both at the local level and around the globe. It has challenged us to again apply an equity lens to how we provide care and how society functions as a whole. As the pandemic rolled out, we began to see an emerging set of symptoms and conditions, often somewhat mysterious, in patients who had experienced COVID-19. Difficult to define, difficult to diagnose, at the time, no way to code for it, but now we can code for it. And um, in, with patients uh, experiencing a persistence, persistence of, of um, symptoms across a variety of organ systems, and it would be important to really put a focus on mental health here as well, the impacts on mental health. Estimates vary, as we all know, but perhaps 10% of individuals who were infected may experience long COVID. Of note, a recent study out of the UK of self-reported long COVID symptoms showed that about one out of every 50 persons in the general population reported symptoms. Now, of course that's self-reported, but that also comes up because we are in a situation where we need to be screening people who present for care. If we extrapolate that to nearly 40 million Californians, that could be close to 800,000 persons self-reporting long COVID symptoms in our state. So it is no wonder that the COVID pandemic is also referred to as a mass disabling event. My point is that we have only likely seen the tip of the iceberg and Omicron likely will push these numbers up quite a bit. And we have a large population that is in need of screening and assessment and support for healing. So this is a call to action. It is time to focus on supporting those individuals with chronic symptoms and we need your help. We all have a role to play and certainly our primary care providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs are of particular importance in helping us care for these patients. It is also important to note that we need to redouble our efforts within communities of color, which have been disproportionately affected by COVID and will likely have the same pattern with long COVID. And we are challenged in how to do that because our health systems are already overburdened in many circumstances and are not really designed to respond to large numbers of uh, individuals who have a common condition. At University of California Health, we formed a long COVID working group, which brings together exper expertise and clinicians who are focusing on running long COVID clinics and taking care of patients, researchers and public health experts uh, also uh, join us this group and we are looking at how we can better respond to the growing numbers of long COVID patients. To this end, we are also working on a long COVID online training course and look forward to sharing that with you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucy Horton, who is our clinical speaker today and is a member of our long COVID working group. Dr. Horton is a board certified infectious disease specialist who cares for patients with complex infections and has extensive experience caring for patients with COVID-19, including those with chronic symptoms. She's the med director of both the UC San Diego Health's COVID-19 employee health and contact tracing group and the ambulatory COVID drive up and results team services. Dr. Horton also founded the post COVID care clinic at UC San Diego Health, which provides multidisciplinary care to patients with long COVID. And she also sits on our working group, as I mentioned. It's my absolute pleasure to um, share this presentation with uh, Dr. Horton today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Anne, and for your, um, your remarks and insight into long COVID and 
you know, what we need to do to take the next step forward in, in addressing this. Um, so, so again, thank you, welcome. Um, I'm gonna give really just kind of a highlight snapshot view of long COVID. Um, it's really complex, we're learning more every day. Um, and so my goal is to just kind of review some of the clinical manifestations, the epidemiology, and then discuss um, some outlines for kind of the clinical approach to managing these patients um, based on our experience uh, caring for these patients in um, our multidisciplinary clinic. Next slide, please. So starting with some definitions, you know, what exactly is long COVID? Well, you know, the definitions actually um, are still evolving. We know that many patients who have COVID infections will continue to have symptoms for weeks, um, months, or even years after their initial infection. And this is often regardless of how severe their initial infection was. Uh, we're still struggling to have a defined terminology. Um, some of the you know, terms that have been used are long COVID, post-COVID syndrome, post-acute COVID-19 syndrome. Uh, patients are often referred to by the lay public as long haulers, um, and this is kind of where long COVID came from. Uh, last year, the NIH did announce a terminology of post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection, or PASC, which kind of is a term to, you know, encompass all of these different post-acute uh, phases. Next slide, please. You know, I really like to, you know, think of COVID-19 as a spectrum. And I think this um, image highlights that really kind of from the acute COVID infection um, continuing to the post-acute phases. You know, when we talk about long COVID or PASC, we're really referring to patients that are in kind of the right right hand side of this image. So those that are in the chronic post-acute phase, at this point, the infection has ended. You know, there's no longer active um, viral replication or um, the ability to isolate the virus from the respiratory tract, uh, but patients may continue to be symptomatic. Um, but again, it's not due to ongoing um, viral replication. Next slide, please. Long COVID can overlap with many of the other complications um, of acute COVID-19 illness. Um, and so sometimes it's a little bit hard to tease out what is long COVID versus, you know, what could be attributed to complications from a prolonged hospitalization, for example, or an ICU stay. Uh, we know that some of the effects um, from, you know, hospitalization could include, for example, uh, tracheal stenosis from prolonged intubation, um, severe weakness, deconditioning, a uh, post-intensive care syndrome, um, other things like PTSD, for example. Next slide, please. Um, so this was a really nice systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in late 20, um, 2021, um, where they looked at really all the publications to date on long COVID. So it was over 18,000 publications, um, and 15 of them met the inclusion criteria for the systematic review. Um, and based on this, the authors were able to estimate the prevalence of 55 long-term effects, um, they did 21 meta-analyses, and this was almost 50,000 patients included across um, the full adult um, age spectrum. Um, the studies um, had different definitions of long COVID. So some, you know, said symptoms as early as 14 days, um, up to 110 days um, were defined as long COVID. So it was a bit of, um, you know, heterogeneity in terms of um, the follow-up periods. But they found that 80% of patients still had one or more symptoms at time of follow-up. Next slide, please. And the most common symptoms that they found were fatigue in 58%, headache, 44%, attention deficit, 27%, hair loss in 25%, and dyspnea in 24%. But you can see that patients reported continuing symptoms in almost you know, all organ systems um, of the body and a huge range of symptoms. Next slide, please. Um, and they also um, included some studies that looked specifically at lab tests and other um, examinations. And they found that there was abnormal lung imaging in about a quarter of patients, either an abnormal CT or chest X-ray. 
um, as well as elevated levels of pro-inflammatory biomarkers. Um, and these would include elevated levels of D-dimer, um, pro-BNP, C-reactive protein, ferritin, procalcitonin, and IL-6, which indicates ongoing inflammation um, in these patients who reported continuing symptoms. Next slide, please. So some general themes um, about long COVID that you know, we've noticed based on our experience with these patients over the last year and a half are that patients tend to present with a constellation of symptoms. Oftentimes, many organ systems are involved simultaneously. Sometimes patients present with just a persistence of their initial COVID symptoms, but sometimes they develop new symptoms that can start weeks or even months after their initial recovery from the acute illness. So they may initially feel better, you know, in their isolation period, and then the, the long COVID symptoms can start weeks or months later, which can often make it a little bit more challenging to identify that they are in fact due to long COVID. Symptoms often wax and wane. A patients will report having good days and bad days, good weeks and bad weeks, um, you know, kind of episodes of long COVID symptoms. Diagnostic testing is often normal. Um, and there's often a really strong psychosocial component. Um, and I think it's really hard to tease that out. You know, what is, you know, due to long COVID versus what is due to the stress of being sick, the stress of the pandemic, um, or underlying mental health issues. We often see um, what I like to call an unmasking of other conditions. Um, so patients who will present with new or worsening um, signs and symptoms of conditions like reflux, asthma, or sleep issues. Um, I think it's a little bit unclear whether these um, are kind of new diagnoses and the infection triggered them um, to develop or whether patients were just very uh, posse symptomatic before, but perhaps they've lost their threshold to compensate. And so these conditions um, become more bothersome to them. Oftentimes, long COVID patients will end up getting diagnosed with other specific conditions, um, especially asthma, POTS, um, things like reactive arthritis, as well as um, some psychiatric diagnoses like depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Next slide, please. Now I'm just gonna highlight um, a couple of the organ-specific kind of manifestations of long COVID that are most commonly seen. So starting with pulmonary, um, really the pulmonary manifestations are probably the most uh, common post-acute symptoms. A chronic cough is often seen. Um, this can really be multifactorial. Um, it can be due to asthma or uh, reactive airway disease. Uh, we are diagnosing a lot of laryngopharyngeal reflux in our patients. So I think it's also important to consider reflux as a cause of uh, chronic cough. PFTs may show um, a decrease in the diffusion capacity, uh, but usually uh, the other measures are preserved. A chest X-ray and CT chest may show scarring, uh, but are typically normal. And we often see um, dysfunctional patterns of breathing. So if you know the lungs themselves may not be damaged or injured, um, but rather the way the lungs move is abnormal. So there is um, the way that the diaphragm and chest wall moves um, kind of creates this um, instead of kind of you know nice um, expansion of the lungs, you know patients are more breathing kind of with their ribs. It causes a lot of chest pain um, and discomfort, and it also causes a sensation of shortness of breath. Um, and in this situation, breathwork exercises can be really useful to retrain the muscles of breathing. I think it's also important to do an assessment about sleep and potentially evaluate patients for undiagnosed sleep apnea, which is commonly found in patients with long COVID. Next slide, please. Um, so touching on the cardiovascular manifestations, uh, what we see is a lot of dysautonomia. So patients who are presenting with tachycardia um, and orthostasis, um, you know, can, orthostatic vital signs are a really easy way to screen for this um, in clinic. Um, there's a lot of exercise intolerance and post-exercise fatigue. The physiology can often resemb uh, resemble severe deconditioning. Um, 
there is, you know, this growing understanding that long COVID can trigger POT syndrome, um, which can be precipitated again by cardiac deconditioning. Um, it's seen more often in women who are of childbearing age. Um, the orthostatic vital signs can be a good screening test as well as, you know, a good history. Um, and then tilt table testing would be uh, the more definitive diagnosis for POTS. Um, and there are medications and exercises and kind of lifestyle modifications that are quite successful in managing POTS. Um, patients may also report uh, chest discomfort and palpitations, which can be unrelated um, to POTS or the statics. Um, EKGs may show tachycardia or PVCs, but are mostly normal. Um, and echoes are almost always normal. Next slide, please. Um, as Anne mentioned, you know, the mental health aspects of long COVID are immense. Um, and we know that, you know, many, many patients, probably the majority of patients with long COVID will have some sort of psychiatric manifestations. Um, the Lancet Psychiatry published a nice study last year that did a six-month follow-up um, of about a quarter million COVID patients, um, specifically looking at uh, new neuropsychiatric diagnoses. Um, and they found that about a third of the patients had a neuropsychiatric diagnosis. I mean, 12 of them, 12, sorry, 12% 12 uh, were new since having COVID. Uh, the most common were anxiety and depression. Although there were a minority with uh, more serious conditions like stroke and dementia. And they found the highest rates were in those patients who had ICU admissions. So, you know, perhaps this again is kind of an overlap with that post ICU syndrome where we know there's a lot of anxiety and depression that comes out of that. Sleep disorders were seen in up to 30% of patients. So, again, really important to consider sleep um, and um, doing symptom screening uh, for sleep disorders. Um, there was a large burden of pandemic-related stress. And we know that, um, you know, some patients may experience PTSD-like symptoms uh, related to their acute illness. Next slide, please. Specifically looking at the neurologic aspects of long COVID, um, the most common symptom reported is brain fog. Um, you know, this can include difficulty concentrating, short-term memory loss, impairments in executive function. And brain fog is really debilitating. And I think, you know, from a societal level, this is one of the symptoms that's really preventing people from going back to work full time, from kind of re-engaging in their daily lives. Um, many patients will have headaches. Um, this can either be a new headache or a worsening of a pre-existing headache disorder, such as migraines. Um, it's not uncommon to see patients who previously had very um, kind of intermittent and well-controlled migraines now have um, daily migraines that don't really seem to respond well to typical migraine treatments. Neuroimaging is almost always normal. Um, there's rarely any evidence of inflammation um, or infectious lesions or strokes seen on brain MRI. Um, MRIs often will show white matter changes, but these are usually not concerning um, unless they're severe. And there's really no clear correlation with COVID because we know that white matter changes can be due to things like age, um, underlying migraine disorders, or vascular disease. Um, and cognitive testing is uh, really important for patients who are reporting brain fog symptoms. The MOCA is a really good screening test that can easily be done by um, you know, an assistant or somebody in the medical office. And based on that, you can determine if a patient may benefit from further cognitive screening. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, the role of vaccination in long COVID is something that's received a lot of attention recently. Um, and so I wanted to make sure to briefly mention it today. Long, having long COVID is not a known contraindication to COVID vaccination. Um, and I have seen many patients who tell me that they've been told not to get vaccinated because they have long COVID. Um, and there's really not a strong reason to recommend that to patients. There have been several studies that suggest that vaccination may actually improve or resolve symptoms in some patients. Although I will note that in all of those studies, there were a small subset of patients that reported worsening or relapsing symptoms. But overall, more patients report a improvement in symptoms 
compared to a worsening of symptoms, although many report no changes in symptoms overall. Um, and when we look at studies assessing the effectiveness of vaccination before infection, it looks like vaccine may reduce the likelihood of developing long COVID symptoms. So it's, you know, another benefit of vaccination may be that patients would be less likely to develop long COVID, even if they did have a breakthrough infection. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, the big question is what causes long COVID or PAPS? And it's really still unknown. Um, you know, we're getting more and more evidence every day of kind of some different mechanisms, but kind of the underlying pathophysiology and, you know, is really, I think, still largely unknown. Um, we don't have any clear correlations of long COVID with antibody levels um, or with severity of disease. I think certain symptoms may be more common in people who had more severe illness, but overall development doesn't seem to be tied to hospitalization um, or severe illness. Um, some of the potential mechanisms may include virus-specific pathophysiologic changes, so actually actual damage by the virus during acute infection. Um, there is likely a large perturbation of both the immune responses and inflammatory responses that are triggered by the acute viral infection. And we know this um, you know, from other uh, post-acute um, viral infections. There's some you know, expected sequelae of post-critical illness in a subset of patients. Some of the other possible factors um, you know, that have been proposed include that the viral infection may trigger autoimmunity. Um, there's been some findings of um, virus neutralizing antibodies um, cross-reacting cross with brain tissue, for example, that suggests you know, involvement of specific autoimmunity in certain organ systems. Uh, Long-term viral persistence has also been proposed. Um, to date, we haven't really found any long-term viral persistence in patients with long COVID. Um, but you know, our experience from other viral infections has been that it, sometimes it takes years to find that the virus is hiding out in immune-privileged parts of the body. Um, and there's probably you know, some fibrosis and other changes in lungs, heart, and other organs. Although perhaps the imaging that we're using is not sensitive enough to detect some of these um, uh, more subtle uh, changes. There's definitely a component of autonomic nervous system dysregulation um, that may be tied to endothelial um, dysfunction. And again, the psychological component is often integrated. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to kind of tease out um, different mechanisms. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just kind of a really um, general outline of um, the approach that we've taken to long COVID workup and management. You know, the workup really should be limited. Um, it should focus initially on ruling out clinically concerning signs and symptoms. So it should be symptom-based. Um, as you can see, you know, there is you know, probably over 200 symptoms that have been reported in long COVID. And so you can't possibly do testing for every possible symptom. You really have to target it at the specific symptoms the patient's having. Um, you know, I will note that normal test results and ruling out other serious conditions can often serve a therapeutic purpose for many patients. Um, you know, we shouldn't just do um, lots of test results just for that reason, but I think it is important to acknowledge that. Cognitive testing, um, like the MOCA screen, can help identify true deficits. Um, physical rehabilitation is a really key component. So um, this can include pulmonary rehab um, and or physical therapy. Um, but it's important to take a really slow stepwise approach to progressing in any physical activities so that it doesn't trigger relapses of symptoms. Um, you know, I, I would consider, you know, using integrative medicine approaches. Um, we've had a lot of success with using acupuncture to treat pain and fatigue. Um, so, you know, I would keep an open mind, um, especially if you have integrative medicine um, facilities or practitioners available um, in your health systems. Um, it's really important to address mental health issues and sleep disturbances, including, um, you know, the five pillars of health. So mental, physical, emotional, social, um, and spiritual. Um, in general, we recommend only referring the most medically complex patients to specialty long COVID clinics, just because 
you know, these clinics are limited. There may be long wait times. And um, I really think that primary care providers and community care providers can do a lot of the initial symptom workup and screening. Um, and, you know, we really try to focus on healing rather than therapies. Um, there aren't any targeted long COVID therapies available. And so, you know, we just want, we want to um, offer ways for patients to heal while, you know, we're hoping to eventually get um, more, uh, better therapies in the future. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up with describing some of the clinical challenges in long COVID. You know, I think it's important to note that not all post-COVID is long COVID. Um, not all patients presenting with symptoms after a COVID infection truly have long COVID. Um, and in a sense, long COVID is a diagnosis of exclusion after other illnesses have been ruled out. Um, and I think this is especially true for patients who don't have a confirmed COVID diagnosis. Um, they, you know, may have felt that they had had a COVID illness, but we don't actually have any documentation for that. Um, you know, and, it, and it's important to know that COVID may exacerbate pre-existing conditions and the patients may not just have been, you know, aware of those previously, or they may not have ever sought care for those conditions previously. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's really difficult still to understand the underlying pathophysiology and disease processes. And we don't really have any standard diagnostic criteria. Uh, we lack clear guidelines for evaluation and treatment. Um, oftentimes there's lack of uniformity in the approach to long COVID within the same institution. So I do think we need um, more large prospective studies. A lot of these are underway right now. Um, this will help us better evaluate the natural course of COVID infection, truly define the long COVID syndrome, and identify the best rehab techniques and clinical management strategies. This has, you know, the potential to be a really resource intense condition. Um, you know, oftentimes for the most complex patients, multidisciplinary care is needed. So it does have a potential to be a huge strain on the health system um, with lots of demand for ancillary services and support staff. So I think it's really important that, you know, we plan for the surge of patients um, and do our best um, to kind of manage them in the most equitable manner that we can. Next slide, please. So I'll just close with this quotation, healing is a matter of time, but it's sometimes also a matter of opportunity. And so really, you know, our goal is to help all long COVID patients heal um, and to find kind of their own path um, towards a recovery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was incredibly um, dense and informative, and this is such an important condition for us to begin to understand. I'm going to invite back Dr. Horton and Dr. Pond so that we can ask a few more questions, um, and we've got lots of questions today. Um, before we dive into some long COVID um, or past questions. Erica, uh, some people have been asking just about the virus variants and just wanted to know about the Omicron variant. I think it's BA2 that we've been reading about and any other variants on the horizon, if you could just give us an update there. Sure, yeah, um, and happy to try to remember to include that next time. So BA2, we are definitely seeing increases in that. That um, And it's interesting, it's a variant that some argue should be a whole nother like variant because it's so different when you look at the genomic trees um, to the other um, the sort of other Omicron variants. Um, so we are seeing an increase. It's still less than 10%, I think, in California, but certainly in some of the wastewater surveillance, we're seeing higher proportions. Um, so I do think it's increasing, but in it is increasing while we're seeing a decreasing number of cases. So we're encouraged by that. Um, there's definitely data out there that BA2 is more infectious, but not necessarily more severe. Um, so that's what we're watching. We've also seen um, a handful of cases uh, uh, in the country and, and at least one in California of what they're calling Delta Cron, which is like a crossover between Delta and Omicron. Um, again, clinical significance of this is still, and, and even epi significance has not really we're not to be so concerning yet, but but it is to, to us a harbinger that, you know, the next one will come. We just don't know when, um, and we're monitoring those closely. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Lucy, I'm going to dive in with you just to, to drill down on some of the information that you asked. Some, some people had 
of course, so many questions. One question that I had looking at that meta-analysis that defined it as anything from 14 days to 110 days, How in that first slide that was so informative that sort of looked to me like maybe after four weeks is when you start thinking about something as prolonged or long. What do you think of as a prolonged or long infection? Yeah, great question. So we typically think of kind of the post-acute phase starting at four weeks um, from the onset of initial symptoms. And then we typically define true long COVID as 12 weeks or longer. Um, and I know that um, our clinic and many of the other um, clinics um, in Southern California do use that 12 week cutoff um, as kind of um, the screening for patients to be eligible to be seen in the clinic. Great, really helpful. And what about, is there data on how long this syndrome, though it's so varied, how long it lasts? You know, what's the average thing? Are we seeing it ending? Is it sort of go on forever? Yeah, I would say um, we have seen many patients who have a recovery, um, you know, it, it's it's so varied. It's just like the presentation of COVID is so varied. Um, many will have a good improvement within six to 12 months. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But, um, you know, we're reaching like the two year mark of the pandemic. And so there are a subset of patients who've been symptomatic for two years. You know, I think if we look at the um, kind of limited experience with the original SARS, so um, SARS-CoV-1, we know that um, people who had, um, you know, persistent symptoms, a lot of them improved within the first few years, but then there's, you know, a small subset that continued to have um, symptoms. Okay, great. And then I'd just love to hear any of your opinions on, if you have them, you know, the evidence of prevalence um, vary really widely in the literature that we're seeing. And Dr. Foster, you, you said the number one in 50. Um, anybody have any real sense of where we are? I'll just add that that was self-reported on that UK right. study. And so that, uh, you know, many people may rule out and or there are other causes for their symptoms. So um, that wouldn't be, I would see a, a, a specific defined um, number. It's all self-reported. It's all referred to Lucy, but 10%, I've heard up to 30, but that seems very high. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen everything right, like 10 to 30%, although in that initial post-acute phase, it can be as high as like 70 to 80%. Um, I think it's What's really challenging is many of the studies are, um, yeah, rely on um, self-reporting of symptoms. Um, and this is a disease where often you can't do a diagnostic test to prove that somebody has long COVID. So you have to rely on symptoms and that, that makes it really challenging. Um, you know, I, the other thing is, um, you know, a lot of the symptoms, especially like the neurologic and kind of the, the mental health type symptoms, you know, it's impossible to tease out what is truly caused by long COVID and what is caused by kind of the collective trauma that everyone's experienced from two years of living in the pandemic. And I don't know that we'll ever truly sort that out. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's very important to know that prolonged sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 are substantially, it looks like lower in people who are vaccinated. Um, what do we know about the frequency of long COVID in other, in different patient populations? For example, patients with chronic diseases or maybe autoimmune diseases, immunocompromised patients. Are there rates um, that are become, becoming obvious about who is maybe more at risk or less? Really good question. You know, there hasn't been as much data coming out about that, um, but there were two studies that were published um, earlier this year looking at potential predictors for developing long COVID. And one study did identify um, asthma and diabetes as risk factors. Um, and another study looked more at kind of um, specific immunologic profiles. Um, which suggested that having, um, for example, like EBV viremia at the time of diagnosis, um, you know, I, I don't, I think that's more important for identifying that people who may have been immunocompromised or um, critically ill, because we often see EBV viremia in those populations may develop long COVID. Um, but at this point, you know, we don't know other clear, clear risk factors. Um, there does seem to be a female predominance. Um, but that hasn't really been teased out yet. Thanks. And you know, that study in the psychi Psychiatric Journal was a fascinating study and so many patients, amazing. Um, but 
I, I was a little bit curious if they had ICU controls for non-COVID ICU patients to sort of, is there a comparison of what we know is the baseline of percentage of people who have, who get post ICU syndrome versus um, maybe, you know, this syndrome is adding to that burden or did you have a sense of that? Yeah, so the majority of patients in that study were not in the ICU, um, so they didn't kind of specifically do um, like a case control for like ICU versus non-ICU. Um, but that, you know, we do know, like you mentioned, there's in anyone who's been um, in the ICU, high rates of depression and anxiety. But again, that's a small subset of COVID patients overall. Okay, thanks. And what about kids? What do we know about pediatric long COVID? Does it manifest differently? Different symptoms, like they tend to maybe have a little bit in COVID. And then is there any correlation with MISC? I have to say that I'm not a pediatric expert just because, you know, I'm a, I'm an adult doctor and all the patients we've seen have been adults, um, but this is a growing question. And so we're, even here in San Diego, we're trying to collaborate with our, our colleagues at the Children's Hospital to start looking into this. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of research gaps in long COVID, but pediatrics is definitely one of the bigger ones. Great, Erica, just being a pediatric infectious disease doc, has this been on your radar? Do you have a sense of that? Just similar to what Dr. Horton said, though, it's it's a, a big gap that we need to address. And really, I think as we think about kind of what we can do in California, we, we definitely want to highlight that as well. But no, I, I don't have more data than that. Although I will add what I didn't mention, we have almost 900 MISC cases already in California. So it's a pretty big number as far as that specifically. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I have so many more questions, but I think I have hopefully have time to to slip in two more. Um, Dr. Horton, how do we decide um, as primary care uh, clinicians, for example, which patients need evaluation and treatment in one of the multidisciplinary post-COVID clinics versus those that we can kind of treat and manage on their own with maybe some specialty referrals? Yeah, good question. Um, I think it would probably depend on, you know, how symptomatic the person is. Um, if they have a lot of underlying complex conditions, um, you know, maybe that's somebody that you'd want to first send to um, specialists if they have a concurrent, um, you know, autoimmune disorder, um, for example, um, you know, or if they're not responding to kind of first line treatments, um, if you think they need, um, you know, more complex neurocognitive testing, that might be something that in, can only be available like an academic medical center. Great, that's that's a helpful rule of thumb. Um, and, and then finally, I'd just like to ask Drs. Foster and Pawn about sort of how we're thinking about systems of care at this time. So maybe Erica, you can talk a little bit about what, if anything, the state is concrete, concretely thinking about how to help manage all of these patients that we expect to have with prolonged systems of care. And we've seen some national legislative efforts or there any state legislative efforts to pay for this sort of thing. And then Dr. Foster, maybe if you just want to end with a, a, a comment on how University of California systems thinking about that. Um, sure, from my perspective, I think, um, you know, just starting to <laughs> come up for air and really think about all of this. Um, and absolutely kind of thinking about systems of care and also how we, again, kind of follow and assess the impact of both long COVID and, and other impacts of this pandemic. Um, and really look forward to partnering, you know, moving forward with, with UCOP and others on, on looking at that. So I think it's an important question we're just starting to address. Excellent question. <laughs> Uh, excellent question, one that I actually worry about a lot. Um, I think it needs to be, the, the assessment and the initial care of these patients needs to be part and parcel, part and parcel of the average practice um, uh, focus. Uh, we are all in it together. Uh, we, we know the numbers are large. Um, certainly we are happy to receive referrals for complex patients, but we do not have the capacity to really manage everyone. So I really encourage um, all, particularly primary care providers, to um, empower themselves as best as possible to do that initial assessment and then, you know, seek the, the additional care from specialty or other services. Uh, within, within the UC system, there is a long COVID clinic at all of our academic medical campuses. I think that there's wait time um, I think that the, the demand far exceeds our own capacity. And again, the need for all of us to, to be engaged and refer appropriately. 
Um, and uh, um, there's 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 good information out there that is suggesting that our healthcare systems will need to redesign themselves to really manage this across the nation. Yeah. Well, with that and uh, the the opportunity falls on all of us to really help these patients. Um, get back to a place where they can really thrive in the setting of this complex illness. Um, and I really appreciate all of you coming today and all of our listeners listening to this important topic. Um, I wish we had more time, but I really want to thank you all for presenting today's content. Just as a reminder, our next session, this is a monthly um, speaker series, will be on Tuesday, April 5th. That's a little bit earlier than our normal schedule, but we hope to see you all there and more information is available at covidroundsca.com. And just a reminder to complete your survey if you want CME for this. Um, and thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.